Well, I have to tell you that this past Wednesday, I had the privilege, really the solemn honor, of doing what I have done literally hundreds of times over the last three decades. And that is, in a cold cemetery this past Wednesday afternoon at 2.30, I stood in front of a grieving family. There was a a teary-eyed widow sitting right in front of me. She was flanked on both sides by her adult children who were, you could tell, bearing her load with her, helping her carry her grief while they were experiencing their own loss and their own grief. And in front of them, in his casket, lay the body of her husband, their father, and in this case, my friend. And I stood next to that casket on Wednesday, and I put my hand on it as I spoke to them, and I, and I, I patted it like I, was, like I was patting an old friend, and I was. And, and I made the most audacious statement that you could ever imagine to that family. I said these words as I patted his casket. He will rise again. Can you imagine such a thing? Can you imagine standing next to a body which has no life in it whatsoever, none. It is dead and has been for days. And having the audacity to say, this body will rise again one day. Well, I said it. And I said it with confidence, and I would say it again to you. If not, not would, I will. I will say it again to you today with just as much confidence. He will rise again, and I know he will. And with that assurance, I want to welcome you to week three, the final week of this brief little series where since the beginning of the year, we have been thinking together about come and see. This initiative, this invitation, this this drive that we feel burning in our souls to invite those that we know and love to come and see Jesus. Beginning today, not only are we concluding this teaching series, but more importantly, so much more importantly, we are launching into a year-long come and see initiative. Beginning today, we will prayerfully, and strategically and steadily invite our friends and our neighbors and our relatives and our coworkers and our classmates, everyone that we know and love, beginning today, we will begin to prayerfully and steadily and strategically invite them to come and to see Jesus at Brookstone Church. And by the end of the year, by the time this year is over and we stand here at the end of the year, we will have prayerfully and strategically and steadily invited over 20,000 of our loved ones to come and see Jesus. And I want to remind you of what it is that we agreed together about last week. And I know you weren't here and I just said it, but I'm assuming you agree with me on this. And so I'm going to say it that way. Let me remind you of what we have agreed together, that this campaign is not. And I don't want you to miss what I'm getting ready to say. So if you're listening to me at home or in the room, would you shout amen? Amen. Don't miss this. The come and see initiative for 2022 is not a church growth campaign. Hear your pastor. This is not an effort to grow this church numerically. I promise you that is the very least of my concerns. Rather, it is an intentional rescue effort, an intentional rescue mission to reach out to our loved ones who need Jesus. The second thing that we are not doing in Come and See in 2022 is we are not inviting anyone to come and see Brookstone Church. Because while I love our church and I love you, can we be honest, we're not all that in a bag of chips, all right? I mean, we're not the most impressive thing in the world. And so we're not inviting anybody to come and see us. 
Come and see our programs. Come and see our church. But what we are inviting people to do is to come to the assembly of our church and to come and see Jesus, who is able to transform their lives both here and in eternity. And so last Sunday, while we were having our online service because of the snow, I asked this question and tried to answer it. If we're not inviting them to come and see us and we're not inviting them to come and see our church, what exactly are we inviting them to? Or who exactly is it that we are inviting them to come and see? Let me remind you the answers to those, to those two questions. When we invite our friends and loved ones to come and see in 2022, we're inviting them, first of all, to come and see the God who is before all things. And we talked about this last Sunday from John chapter 1. Verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says, The same was in the beginning with God. It goes on, John goes on to talk about how that he is the creator and he's made all things. We, we uh, learned last Sunday that we're inviting people to come and see this transcendent God who has always existed and who always will exist, this God who predates our predicaments and who will outlast all of our troubles. And this is important. Because every single person that you know wakes up every single morning facing various degrees of crises and troubles and struggles and worries and failures and bondages and addictions and fears. And all of those things are a part of life. And every morning they wake up and they bear those burdens. And what we're saying to them is come and see a God who existed before those burdens came about, who will exist after those burdens are over, and bring your problems and put them into the perspective of this eternal God who controls all things. That matters deeply. That's important. So we're inviting them to come and see this God who is before all things. The second thing that we're inviting them to come and see is that we're inviting them to come and see the work of Christ, that this God who always has existed has entered into our world in the person of his son Jesus and that Christ has done an incredible work. Christ has done an amazing work in the world and so we're inviting them to come and see his work of incarnation, that he came literally from heaven to earth. We're inviting them to come and see his work of revelation, that it's in Christ that we truly understand God. That Christ is the revelation, the very image of God in the flesh. And then thirdly, we're, coming to, we're inviting them to come and see the work of redemption. That is the work of redemption that Christ has afforded to us through his work on the cross. Now I ask you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 because I want to I begin today by hooking back up with that thought of the work of redemption. If, if I could, I want to sort of hitch up to what we learned last week about Christ's work of redemption and connect it to what we're going to learn today. So let me begin with you in 1 Peter chapter 1 where Peter speaks very eloquently about this work of redemption. We're going to begin reading in verse number 18. 1 Peter 1 and verse number 18. The Bible says, For as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Now, if you have a pen in your hand and you're a note taker, I want to ask you to circle the word redeemed. There's that word redemption or redeemed in verse 18. Circle it. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Everybody look up here. I want you to say this word out loud with me, the word precious. Say it, precious. The blood of Christ is precious. Another way we would say it is priceless, beyond value. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. You have not been redeemed by your own resource. You didn't buy your way into redemption. You didn't work your way into redemption. If you're redeemed, you're redeemed by one thing, and that is by the blood of Christ, which Peter says is precious or priceless. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 
but was manifest in these last times for you. For you who by him, that is by Christ, you do believe in God. You believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope might be in God. Now let's talk about this word redeemed for a minute. Verse 18, you have not been redeemed with silver and gold. What does it mean to be redeemed? Let me ask you another question. Are you redeemed? Have you been redeemed? The word means to be set loose or to be bought back from. It's the idea of a ransom has been paid to secure your freedom. You might think of a person who's kidnapped and a ransom call is made and the kidnappers say, if you will pay X amount of ransom, then I will set you free. Maybe something we would be more familiar with would be a ransomware that might be put on a network of a company. They would lock down your ability to do business until you paid a ransom and then they would release uh, your servers and let you get back to business. It simply means that someone is held in bondage. Someone is held in captivity and they have been redeemed or released from that captivity because the ransom has been paid. Peter says, verse number uh, 18, you were, not, you were redeemed, not with silver and gold. And then look at what he says in verse number 18, from your vain conversation. Now listen, what Peter says is, is that we are redeemed, if we are, we have been redeemed from something. We have been redeemed from, well, what have we been redeemed from? He says, your vain conversation. That's the King James. Here's what it means. Your vain means empty. Conversation means life or lifestyle or living. You have been redeemed from your empty life. Listen, church. If you have been redeemed, you have been redeemed from the way you once lived. The Bible says this over and over again. One notable place is in the book of Titus. Will you turn back there with me, please? Go to Titus. It's just a few pages forward, right in front of the book of um, uh, Hebrews, or Philemon Hebrews. Look in Titus chapter 2. Listen to verse number 11. Paul writing to Titus says this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that is, he shed his precious blood, according to Peter, who gave himself for us that he might, say that loud with me, what did he come to do? To redeem us. He shed his precious blood. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us. Look at the next word. From. Do you understand? If you are redeemed, you were redeemed from something. Peter says, from your empty life. Paul to Titus says, look at it, verse 14, that you, he might redeem you from all iniquity. The word means lawless living. He gave his precious blood so that he might redeem those who would believe that God raised him from the dead, believe the gospel, that they might be redeemed from an empty life marked by lawlessness. Now I just want you to hear me. I, don't miss this. If you claim to be redeemed, but you still live the same lawless, empty, godless life that you lived before you said you got redeemed, it's a fair bet that you're not redeemed. Because he didn't redeem you so you could keep living the same way you've always lived. He redeemed you so that you could leave the life you've always lived and li leave the life you've always lived and live a different life. And what was that different life look like? Look at it. You're in Titus chapter number two, teaching us that, verse 12, renouncing or denying, it means renouncing 
ungodliness. Christian, are you redeemed? Renounce ungodliness. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. You're not. But it means that you're going to renounce a life that is godless. I'm not going to live a godless life. I've been redeemed from that life. He says re- uh, denouncing, uh, renouncing or denying godliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, means with dignity according to his word, righteously and godly in this present world, that we would look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the truth. Jesus came to redeem. He gave his blood to redeem. He died on the cross to redeem people who would trust in him, renounce that old life, and begin to live a life that follows him and looks for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And if that does not describe your life, then I would encourage you to check on your redemption. And you say, Pastor, why are you preaching so hard at us this morning? Why are you, why are you saying all of this this morning? Here's why. Listen to me. Because in the day in you, which you and I live and in the churches that dot this country, there is a, there is a theology that's false that says all you have to do is somehow you prayed a prayer at some point, but nothing ever changed in your life, and you look back to that prayer when you were four or six or eight or ten or whatever, yeah, I prayed that so I know I'm going to heaven, but there's nothing in your life that looks godly. There's nothing that's ever denounced ungodliness. There's nothing that looks forward to the coming of Christ, and there's no desire to honor him. He says redeemed people have been brought from something to something. So check your soul. And if you say this morning, Pastor, you're not nice. You're making me doubt my salvation. I'm not making you doubt your salvation. It's your godless living that's making you doubt your salvation. Make sure that you know Jesus because he has redeemed a people who he goes on to say in this verse, verse number 14, a people who would be his people and who would be zealous to honor him. Okay? We are redeemed from an old life to a new life. Now go back to 1 Peter where he says to us that this, this faith, this hope that we have of being redeemed is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus. Look at it. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 21. He gave himself so that those who by him do believe in God, those who by Christ believe in God, that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and your hope might be in God. Now both Peter and Paul in the book of Titus tell us that this hope of redemption and this hope of a transformed life is rooted in the death, the shed blood, and in the resurrection of Jesus. And so gratefully, thankfully, the Bible tells us some things about the resurrection of Jesus. And so I want you to go over to where you've been holding that place in Matthew 28, and let's read about what the Bible says about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Matthew 28, beginning in verse number one. Let's read it. So the Bible says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning. His raiment was as white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before them into Galilee. There you shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher. And with fear and great joy, they did run to bring the disciples' word. I love the fact that verse number 8 says, with fear and with great joy. This is the beauty of the Christ life. This is the beauty of walking with the living Christ. That there is fear, but there's joy. 
There's wonderment and there's thrill. There's terror at the holiness of this God, but there's joy at the intimacy that we have with this God. He says, go quickly and tell his disciples. And they did with wonder and with joy. Now go back up to verse number six of Matthew 28. Did you see the invitation in verse number six? Did you see the come and see invitation where the angel said to them, come and see. Come and see that the tomb is empty. Come and see that the Lord is alive. Now there are three groups of people in this passage, three groups of people that needed to hear this come and see invitation from the angels. And these three groups of people perfectly parallel the three groups of people that we need to be inviting to come and see this risen Christ as we go through 20 22. So we're going to talk about each of these three and the invitation that we ought to make to them. In fact, I want you to turn to your neighbor. I want you to help me preach here for just a second. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to say to them, let's go invite. Tell them, tell them, let's go invite. All right, well, who are we going to go invite? Write it down. Let's go invite those who are devoted to Christ, but they're discouraged. Let's go invite those who are devoted to Christ but who are discouraged. In this passage, that would be these women. Now these ladies, God bless them, they were devoted to Jesus. They loved Jesus. They came from Galilee to Jerusalem with Jesus. When Jesus was arrested, they didn't flee back to Galilee. When Jesus was crucified, they were there weeping and watching their Lord die. They were devoted to Jesus. but They were discouraged. Matthew tells us that there were two women who came. Look at it, verse number one. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, that's Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene came and the other Mary to the sepulcher. So Matthew tells us that Mary Magdalene, you remember Mary Magdalene is Mary of Magdala, which is a seaside town at the Sea of Galilee. She was the one out of whom Jesus cast seven demons or seven devils. She loved Christ and was devoted to him. She came. There was another woman with her who was also named Mary, but Matthew doesn't tell us who that Mary was. Mark, however, does give us some insight. Mark tells us that the other Mary is the mother of James the less. Mary the mother of James. Mark also tells us that there was another woman that came with these two Marys. Her name was Salome, not Salome, Salome. And we know who Salome was. She was the mother of James and John, the sons of thunder. It was Salome who came to Jesus during his ministry and said, grant that in your kingdom my two sons might sit on your right hand and your left hand. That's Salome. So we know there were at least three according to Matthew and Mark. There was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and then Mary the mother of James and John. Now Luke goes on to tell us that there's another woman who's in this group. Her name is Joanna. She's with them. Luke says Joanna and others. So we know the others were at least Mary, Mary, and uh, Salome. And then John doesn't tell us any more detail. He emphasizes the fact that Mary Magdalene was there. So we know there were at least five. There was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Mary the mother of James and John, Salome, and Joanna, and others. So there were at least five, maybe six, maybe ten. We don't know exactly. But here's what we know about these women. Man, they were devoted. They loved the Lord. But they were coming to that tomb that morning discouraged. They did not wear their celebration Shoes. They they weren't coming to a worship service because Christ had risen. They were coming to anoint a dead body. That's what they thought they would find. It's what they fully expected to find. They had had to leave his cold body in the tomb as the Passover or the uh, Sabbath was coming, and now the Sabbath is is ended, and so they're back first thing Sunday morning, and, and they're there to anoint his body, not expecting that he's alive. In fact, they're even questioning as they come. Who will roll the stone away? How are we going to get to his body? Now let me ask you, who is it in your life that's like these women? They they love Jesus, but they're discouraged. 
They love the Lord, but it's been so long since they've seen God do anything mighty and powerful in their life. They're just discouraged in their walk. You know what they need? They need an invitation from you to come and see God working mightily. See the risen Christ at work in our presence. And maybe you don't have to look any further than the mirror to see somebody who loves Jesus but's really discouraged. And I want you to know that he worked mightily in your life as well. Well, we should go and invite those who love Jesus, but they're discouraged. All right, who's the second group? Well, look to your neighbor, say it. Let's go invite. Go ahead, say it. Let's go invite. No, 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 I'm not letting you off the hook. That was two weeks. Say it. Let's go invite. There you go. Who is it we're going to invite? Let's go invite those who are opposed to Christ. Really? Yes. Because this is where it gets fun. Let's go invite those who are unbelievers. Now, in the passage, who is that? It's the keepers. This is what, what the Bible says in verse number four when it talks about the keepers. It's the guards at the tomb. Now, understand, these are, these are guards who are stationed at the tomb to protect it. They might have been Romans. They might have been Jews. There's a little bit of uh, controversy. It doesn't really matter, though. These are, these are men, soldiers who are there to protect the tomb. Now listen, they're not there, if y'all are listening, say amen. They're not there to keep Jesus from rising from the dead. They're not concerned that that might happen. They don't think he's going to rise from the dead. And besides, if he did, what are they going to do about it? They're not there to keep him from rising from the dead. They're there to protect the tomb from his disciples. Because the belief is that the disciples are going to come in the night. They're going to take the body away and hide it somewhere and say, hallelujah, he rose and perpetrate a fraud. And so they're there to make sure that he doesn't, that this doesn't happen. You can imagine their conversation, can't you? Can you believe this? We've got to stand out here all night long and guard this silly tomb. And, and, uh, I, and, and they're having this conversation and suddenly the angel of the Lord, you with me, begins to descend from heaven. There's lightning begins to look, uh, look like, his, his raiment is like lightning. He's, he's uh, bright white. The earth begins to quake. And look what the Bible says happened to them in verse number four. They were afraid and they became as dead men. You know what that means? means they fainted on the spot. They might have even wet their pants. I don't know. I couldn't resist saying that. I'm sorry. (laughs) But they fall out. And you know what happened? They became believers. Now, they were paid by the high priest to tell another story. They had to be bought off to keep from telling what really happened. Here's my challenge to you. This year, let's go invite every person you know who's not a believer. Let's invite them to come and hear the truth about Christ and to experience the presence and the power of Christ. And some of them will become believers. And all of them will encounter the risen Christ. You know what I was on April the 29th, 1981, at about 6 o'clock in the evening? I was an unbeliever. And somebody invited me to come and see, and I went and saw. And by 7, 30, or 8 o'clock that night, I was a believer. Let's invite those who were opposed. Who's the third group? Look to your neighbor and say to them, let's go invite. Come on, say it. Let's go invite. Who are we inviting? Let's invite those who are conflicted about Christ. Those who are conflicted. Now, who would that be in the passage? It's the disciples. The disciples who truly are conflicted. Imagine the conflict going on in their hearts. They're in hiding. They have spent three and a half years as disciples of this teacher whom they believed to be and who had claimed to be the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and now he's dead. Killed as an enemy of the state. And they're certain. They're next. And so they're in hiding. I have no doubt that some of them, many of them, most of them, wanted to serve Jesus. They wanted to believe. And they wanted to take their stand with Christ. But for them, in that moment, the price was just too high. Because for them, the price might have meant their very lives. I want to tell you, you know people who have met Christ. Maybe you are this person. You've met Christ. And yet, 
There's this conflict going on in you because you know you should give him your whole life. You know you should surrender completely to him and let him have his way in your life. But the price is too high. It means that you give up all lordship and all control of your life and Jesus becomes your Lord. Let's invite those people. Some of these disciples were conflicted because the price was too high. Some of them just didn't believe anymore. They were doubting at least. We know of Thomas, the famous doubter. But it wasn't just Thomas. The Bible tells us about another disciple named Cleopas. He and another, he and his friend who were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus met them there. And they didn't believe any longer. They had been disciples. They had believed he was the Messiah. But once he was killed, they didn't believe anymore. They were doubters. And so let's invite those who are conflicted. Let's invite the doubters. And some of these disciples, most notably Peter, had failed so horribly that they believed that Jesus would never take them back. You remember the story, right? I mean, all the disciples forsook Jesus and fled when he was arrested, but it was Peter who had denied knowing him. It was Peter who three times that night of his arrest said, I don't know him, I don't know him, you blankety, blankety, blank. I told you, I don't know the man. And Peter knew that even if Christ had risen, it would never be the same. I just want to say to you that you and I rub shoulders with these people all the time. They failed. They're out of the game. They feel like they can never come back. They doubt. They're unsure. They're conflicted. But they need to be invited to come and see this Christ whom the angel said, go tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus wants to see them. They need to be invited to come and see. And when we invite them, when we invite them to come and see this risen Lord, what will they encounter? What is it that they'll experience with him? Three things real quickly. Number one, they'll experience the fact that the gospel really is good news. When they, when they really begin to recognize that Christ is alive, they can acknowledge, they can admit, you know what? If Christ died for me and Christ rose from the dead, then I really can be forgiven. The gospel really is good news. That Christ really does want to forgive me. He does want to redeem me. Can I tell you? That whatever the struggles are, whatever the sins are, whatever the bondages are, whatever the failures are in your life, no matter how big how overpowering, how crippling they are. Hear this, Pastor. Jesus died and rose to redeem you from those things. And he wants to redeem you. And when people encounter the risen Christ, they can be redeemed. Number two, they will learn that we can live a life that's pleasing to God. Why? How is it possible that I can really live the Christian life? Only because Christ is risen. And the living Christ abides within me. He lives this life through me. Number three, they will experience, they will encounter the truth that the risen Christ will come again. The risen Christ will come again. This is what Titus and Peter were talking about. That those who have been redeemed ought to be redeemed from their old life to a new life where they have a zeal to serve God and they look for the coming of the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter four. I stood next to the friend, the casket of my friend last Wednesday, I looked into the eyes of his broken-hearted wife and his children, and I said, not on the basis of my word, but on the basis of God's word, he will rise again. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14 says this, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I'm a believer in that. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, likewise, just as surely as Jesus died and rose again, Christ is coming again. For Paul says it this way in that chapter, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ, my friend, her husband, their father, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When we invite the doubters and the skeptics 
and the broken and the failing. When we invite the discouraged and those who are opposed to come and encounter this risen Christ, they can have an experience with him that will redeem their lives, point them toward his return, where they will look for his return and one day be with him forever. There is no greater privilege than that.